My name is Emmanuel. A few years ago, I began a journey. Disillusioned with my life in the rat race, I wanted to find something better. We live on a troubled planet. There's so much anger, anxiety, fear and confusion. But it can also be a beautiful world. A world alive with possibility and purpose. If only we can learn to unlock it. As I travelled, I met many different people. And I began to realise that the measure of a successful life wasn't about money and material wealth. Rather, that those who would make the most of this world shared four key qualities. Four attributes we each have within us, but that we sometimes don't use to their full. Compassion. Courage. Vision. Wonder. What we carry in our hearts defines us. And as I learned to use these things in my own daily life, the more I was able to shape a better world around me. Now it's time to share my journey. I believe that these four simple concepts can inspire hope and happiness into our world. And I'm going to show you how. Come with me and step inside the four chambers. What if you could leave every person you met in life in a more positive state than when you found them? Whether that be helping someone through a crisis, listening to those who need to be heard, or simply offering a smile to a passerby. What if every interaction you had, no matter how fleeting, made the world a better place? It won't just happen by itself. We need some kind of roadmap, a set of guiding principles to help us on our way. And let's base it on our hearts, with every beat, electromagnetic signals pulse out generating influential energy. Our hearts also comprise four chambers. And if we learn to fill those chambers with the right things, we become a conduit for that energy, passing it on to our friends, our family, the people we meet, and inch by inch, we start pulling this world back in the right direction. So let's drop the cynicism and the negativity and allow ourselves to answer this simple question. What if I could leave everyone I met in a better place than when I found them? Inside the first of our four chambers is compassion, and it's where we can begin to invest some good into the world. Compassion is the ability to empathize, to care, to recognize when someone needs help and then helping them, even if they're a complete stranger. Because as you're about to see, a little compassion can give even the smallest acts extraordinary power. In an idyllic lakeside retreat in northern Minnesota lives the author Kent Nurburn. These days, Kent is a writer and has published several books on Native American history and culture. But some 25 years ago, Kent was making ends meet as a taxi driver. And it was while driving his cab one night that Kent had an experience he later came to write about. This story found its way onto social media and ended up being shared more than three million times. And the reason for that is because it truly demonstrates the value of compassion and our innate human instinct to do good things. I didn't set out to be a cab driver. It was not a profession. Uh, it was a job. I was working to try to be a sculptor and I wasn't making much of a living. I needed to do something else. So I took a job driving a cab and I took what was called the dog shift. And the dog shift is when you drive overnight, you drive all night. You watch a rhythm of the city. I love this rhythm. I loved working within it. Uh, I love the cab. The, other than the dispatcher telling you where to go, you're totally on your own. You're cruising the streets of a city at night and everybody gets in that cab eventually. Well, it was an August night that the story that's become well known took place. It was an August night and it was late. Uh, the bars had closed down. 
So I get this call at 2.30 or 2 o'clock uh, to go to this, uh, this address and I figured, well, it's some kids, some drunk kids going home from a party. You know, they're not going very far. So I said, sure, I'd take the run and went to this apartment building. It was like a fourplex and um, no lights on anywhere. And I thought, well, what do I do here? Do I honk? Do I drive away? A lot of times you, you get what they call the no loads, where you, you drive up to somewhere and there's nobody there and so you just take off again. Well, I got to this building and uh, there was no one there. I wasn't going to honk. I didn't see any lights. I had an address and I always had the measure of my parents in my mind because they were both getting older, both were fairly frail, and I always thought, what would I do? What would I want a driver to do for my own mother, for my own father? So knowing that it was not a tremendously dangerous situation, it wasn't likely to be someone ambushing me for my $12 I had in my pocket, I went up and knocked on the door. And I heard someone say, just a minute, I'll be there. And I heard a sound of uh, someone dragging something across the floor. The door opens and it's this old woman and I guess she was in her 80s. Uh, I remember she had this strange outfit on, it was like a pillbox hat from the 1940s and I remember there was a hat pin in it because my mother used to have hat pins and things and uh, she was dressed up 2.30 in the morning. You get a feel for people and situations and there was an air of ineffable loneliness about this woman. And I, I knew in my gut that this was something I had to do right. And she said, I'm not very strong. Can you help me? Of course I'll help you. And she said, I'm leaving for good. I'm not coming back. So I knew I was taking someone on her last year, on her last ride from that home. This wasn't something that I could take lightly. So I took the time, I took her to the cab and set her in and she got in the back seat. They sit in what you know what you call the queen seat you know, the, the, on the passenger side behind you. And uh, she said that the doctors had told her she didn't have much time. And she told me she had no family, she had nowhere else to go, and that the doctor had said she should go to this nursing home. She gave me an address and I prepared to leave and she uh, said, could you go through downtown? I said, well, it's not the shortest way. I said, I know, but I'd like you to drive me by a few places. And it became apparent to me that this was not going to be a normal journey. And there was no way that I was going to charge this woman for this fare. Over a few dollars to me. This wasn't about me making a living. This was about me giving someone something important in life. I looked at her in the rearview mirror, and what I saw was a woman who was looking at her home for the last time. I didn't want to intrude on her privacy, didn't want to intrude on her, her reflection. But I knew that this was something deeply significant to her just from the way that she looked as we drove away. So we set off through the city and she would direct me, oh, go down this road, go over here. And she'd point to a house and say, this was where my husband and I uh, lived when we were first married. She took me by an old hotel where she had been uh, an elevator operator years ago. She told me the stories about, about running the elevator, about being in the hotel, about the people that she saw. She made me go by an old dance hall that had been converted to a furniture store. And she talked about going dancing, ballroom dancing with her husband. And we just drove through the city. We drove for about two hours, and we pulled up 
to the convalescent home. So I went around, opened the door, helped her out, and I knew this was she and I were going to part. I wasn't going to see her again. I might have had the idea that I would come and visit her, that I would uh, become her friend, but I knew better. I had my own life. There was another person to be picked up. The next day would present another tragedy. There would be another small crisis in my own life. I was never going to see this woman again. I have to pay you. Oh, no, you, you don't owe me anything. Oh, yes, I do. And she uh, said, uh, how much do I owe you? I said, well, you don't owe me anything. Of, of course not. You have to make a living. Are there other passengers? Oh, you're such a good boy. <laughs> and she said, oh, you're such a good boy. And uh, just without thinking, I gave her a big hug. And I could see her eyes glistening. I could see that, I could feel her holding on to me as her last touch with the outside world. A woman with no family, going into an institution. And I knew that was the closing of a life and that I'd been part of the closing of the life. She was going in there forever. And I was getting back in a cab and going down the street to the next person who needed something, the next person that was going to work, the next person that was going to be brandishing a gun, the next person that had a fight with his girlfriend. My life was rolling forward at a speed that I couldn't even comprehend. Her life was stopping. Compassion is, is a learned skill. What I learned in the course of this was to be attentive to other people's emotional situations. I learned to enter into other people's emotional realities. And it became one of the richest experiences that I could ever pass on to anyone. Because you meet people where they live. You meet them where their heart beats. Through empathy with another person's situation, you can exercise compassion and you can give something to them. When I picked up the woman in the cab, it wasn't a choice of being a good person or a bad person, but by doing it, it wasn't that I did a good thing, though I did do a good thing. I'd given her my night so, she could, so I could give her her entire life. I think that's one of the reasons this story has captured the hearts of so many people. People feel they're living in a mean world and that we were selling self-reliance as a virtue and really what we're selling is a kind of selfishness. They're, people are not being raised to be their brothers and sisters keepers. And you want to think you can do something. Giving is ultimately an act of creativity. It's the act of creating something new where nothing existed before. You're loving the world into existence when you give. And that to me is the artistry of ordinary living. The four chambers are really a set of virtues that we can use in our daily lives to help us become more connected to the world around us. And this is important because if we suppress or ignore these virtues, there will always be a sense of disconnection. But when we listen to our hearts and learn to use the extraordinary gifts inside us, we can begin to make a profound difference to our world. One of those gifts is courage, our second chamber because there are times in our lives when we need to be strong, when the right choice is the more difficult choice and all we want to do is run away and hide. Courage can help guide you through the darkest moments in your life. Courage can help see you safely back onto the right path when you find yourself lost. With courage, 
you can overcome the most challenging circumstances, as you're about to see in our next story about a little boy named Austin. He's just, he's always got a smile on his face and he's very smart. There's just something about him that just, it grabs everybody's heart, it just does. I'm so good at hiding. Austin got sick around uh, a week before his third birthday. He uh, started to get flu-like symptoms and um, we had taken him to the hospital that night and then we had found out that he had the meningitis. About a week before his third birthday, they um, amputated all four of his limbs. When they first told me that it was meningitis and that they were, um, that's what they thought it was meningitis, and they were gonna give him, you know, they were gonna start him on the medicine right away, I just figured everything was gonna be okay. Right after they told me they were gonna amputate all four of his limbs, um, I asked, is he gonna live? You know, that was the main thing, you know. Not that he was losing, you know, a part of his body. It, I just wanted to know that he was gonna be okay. And then even then, they couldn't guarantee that he was gonna make it. But that it was necessary for them to amputate in order to try and save his life. I guess one of the things is um, I didn't understand, you know, why, why us, and you know, why him, and um, but you know, essentially, when it all came down to it, I can't change anything. His legs are so short; he doesn't have arms to help him balance. Um, for him, it's very, very difficult. Um, it's just like walking on stilts all day long. It just uses up so much energy. He is exhausted, you know, after walking for an hour. So it's pretty difficult for him. Um, I mean, he's he's little and he's young and he has, you know, decent balance and, and good stamina. But you know, it still is a challenge. I think I think that in his mind, he thinks that they're going to grow back someday. Because he still even says that today. When I get older, when I have hands, arms like my brother, I think that he feels like um, he needs me more now than ever, you know, just, you know, just to know that I was right there by his side and, you know, that I wasn't going to, you know, take off on him. All the kids in his kindergarten class, you know, always ask, um, he doesn't have arms or legs, How, he can't do that. And uh, Austin always has to, has to prove him wrong and show him how he does it and show them that he can do it. He, he doesn't like to say that he doesn't have any arms, he just has little arms. So that's the way he does it. He just proves everybody wrong, you know, that hey, all this stuff can be done. He just, he's truly an inspiration. Austin needs a home to where he can be able to maneuver his motorized wheelchair around. We live in an, a small apartment and we don't have the ramps to get in the house. There's just so many possibilities of what we could do with a new home and to make it more, more adaptable for him. Basically what we would like for Austin to be able to do is become independent as possible. So he can, he's just started kindergarten, so he can be able to hold a pencil um, and have him uh, be able to dress himself, have him go to the bathroom and be able to, to do that by himself. The first time he actually ever uh, climbed up the steps, I, I asked him, uh, I said, do you want to come upstairs with me while I take a bath because he's getting ready for work? And he said, no, Mom, I want to sit down here and watch this movie. And I'm taking a bath and, you know, I have the door open just so I can hear him. And I look over and he's sitting right there. He crawled all the way up the steps by himself. See, Mom, I can get up here, he said. So, yeah, he just surprises me every day. 
I hope to see him uh, driving a car by himself someday, um, living by himself, maybe uh, just telling a story and, you know, and some people are gonna, you know, look at him and think that, you know, hey, it's, my life's not so bad. My turn. I feel blessed and, I mean, there's a lot of hope. Um, he's really inspired me with just by the things that he does and the things he's getting better at and really gives me hope that everything is gonna, everything's gonna be okay and we're all gonna be okay and, you know, every day we get uh, more and more back like everything was in the beginning. Out there, waiting for you, is the life you want to lead. In here, waiting for you, are the things that will make you happy and the person you want to be. Hold on to that thought. Embrace it. Allow yourselves to believe it. Because our next chamber can help you find it. To help reach your full potential, you need vision. There was something you were put on this earth to do. You know there is. And if you close your eyes and listen to your heart, you can see it. Vision can give you a purpose in life. It will guide you to your true calling. And it will map out the road ahead. I can't tell you what that vision is. No one can. It's something different for all of us. But what I can tell you is that if your vision is about making the world a better place, you'll end up with something that money can't buy. We were rescuing racehorses. That's why we started it really and started the charity and we realised it was before there was anything in place at all for racehorses when they'd retired from um, racing. And we were determined to help them because we loved the horses and we just wanted to help those horses that for whatever reason had fallen upon hard times when they had when their racing careers were over. He's come to us and been here all this time. Helen Yeadon has spent her whole life around horses and knows what special bonds we can form with these magnificent creatures. He's such a dear horse. In the early 1990s, Helen and her husband Michael began taking in racehorses who'd been abandoned when they could no longer race. It was hard work and expensive too, with every vet spill, every bag of feed coming from their own pocket. But after six years, Helen and Michael were rewarded when Greatwood achieved charitable status. Today, the charity serves not only as a home for the horses, but it has also helped transform the lives of hundreds of troubled children we realised that some of the older horses that probably couldn't be rehomed um, could actually be used on a programme to help the children. So that was the, where the whole thing arrived, whereby you've got the horses that need jobs, by the way. They can't just be, they're too expensive, these racehorses, to be field ornaments. Um, and they need to have a job. So the horses help the children, the children help the horses. The Great Wood Horsepower Programme has helped dozens of children and young people. One of them, Amy, was a painfully shy 14-year-old when she first came here. But although she found it hard opening up to people, she had a natural affinity with the horses, and one in particular named Monty. I came up through horsepower. Um, I was young, I was probably 14 when I came. Um, very shy, I wouldn't talk to anyone. Um, I was basically scared of meeting new people and Monty was the only one I connected with. I would talk to him more than I would anyone. Um, and then Monty started helping me. I don't know how he helped me, but he just did. Um, for me to talk to other people, he helped me come out of my shell. It was just that instant um, connection. We just saw each other and it was just from then. Um, when I would muck him out, I would sing to him and he would fall asleep in my arms. He's just there for me. I, I talk to him, I tell him things and he just listens. 
And he's like this every time I muck him out. He just doesn't leave me alone. And I love him for that. What we didn't want it to be was something that was uh, not without impact upon a, a child or a young person's life. So we wanted it to count towards their education. Um, so we wanted a structured programme, classroom based, so that children actually learn um, and develop. Um, and it's for emotional literacy, it's for team working skills, it's for those children that don't fl flourish in natural, ord ordinary classroom environments. There's also funny interaction in as much that a withdrawn child can sometimes attract a withdrawn horse. And you can see an interaction between them. So there must be some kind of bond that happens imperceptibly, you know, that, that, can't, that we can't see. Sean first came to Greatwood a little over a year ago. He was having quite a tough time at school. But he loves his animals, especially horses. And since enrolling here, he's flourishing, gaining confidence with the horses and at school. It's fun. But it's tricky to get the right use of how to get on them and how to not scare them and how to pull the reins and stuff and how to kick them on and how to like jump, like how to trot and how to jump. And it was really hard on the first time I rode a horse, but actually I'm brilliant at it now. It helped me probably by being more confident around horses and it's helped me at school a lot. Sean's happiest when he's with the horses. He just loves his animals, so that's his whole life. It revolves around animals. So for him to be able to learn something at Greatwood, no matter how cold it is, um, is a great thing in his life. That makes him go from one week of classroom to another week of classroom. I want to be a jockey because I love horses and I love riding them. And it's this that's perhaps the most rewarding part of Helen's vision for Greatwood that in turn, it has given so many young people their own sense of purpose in life. Purpose that might have lain dormant had it not been for the horses of Greatwood. I'm always going to work with horses, and hopefully I would stay here for a good few years. I don't, I'm not ready to leave this place yet. It's given me a new life. It really has. It's really changed me. Um, it's hard to explain. It's just a really good place. It's changed my life. You get some good stories back, good feedback from schools and and I think it's the impact. That's the, I think that's what really makes it worthwhile. And also the fact that you, you know, you've got people that work here that love what they're doing. So you're actually help. It's, it's all helping everybody, isn't it? Really, I think that's that's the huge thing. That's the huge thing. And the fact that we've 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 helped hundreds of horses and many hundreds of children. We're coming to the end of this journey. And I hope by now you've seen enough to begin your own. But there's one last chamber to look inside before you go that I hope will inspire you and help you to make the most out of your journey ahead. When we get stuck in the routine of day-to-day -day living, it's easy to forget what a gift this thing called life is. And it's important we don't let that happen because a conscious appreciation of the world around you will reap untold rewards. And the way we do that is by engaging our sense of wonder, the fourth chamber. When you were a kid, wonder made you lift up that rock to see what was underneath. It gave you your imagination that enabled you to go anywhere and do anything. And it helped you to grow and develop as a human being. A fuller, more rewarding life is possible. And as our final story shows, a little wonder, an open mind and a never ending love of learning We'll see you on your way. You know, the human brain, if you have an average brain, you're capable of almost anything because of the complexity of our brains. 
billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections. It can process more than two million bits of information in one second. It never forgets anything you've ever seen, anything you've ever heard. And uh, you know, with something like that sitting up here, why would you ever utter the words, I can't? I can't, two words that hold us back and keep us from following our dreams. Many years ago, the words I can't might have defined Ben Carson. Not that you would ever know that from where he is today. Ben is the world's foremost pediatric neurosurgeon based at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. In 1987, he became the first person to successfully separate Siamese twins joined at the brain. He's also the subject of a Hollywood film, a philanthropist, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Amazing achievements, made all the more impressive when set against his troubled childhood. Well, you know, uh, growing up for myself in inner city Detroit in very desperate situations, and we lived in a tenement, large multi-family dwellings, boarded up windows and doors, sirens and gangs, rats and roaches. It, it was a miserable environment. I was a pretty awful student um, and didn't have a lot of belief in myself academically. And uh, neither did my classmates. They all thought I was stupid. They called me dummy. I was the butt of all the jokes. But uh, despite the fact that no one else believed in me, my mother did. You know, we were very poor. There was never money for anything. But it didn't cost anything to get a book from the library. And between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere in the world. I could be anybody. I could do anything. It was like an escape from my world of poverty and violence to places that you could only imagine. Almost as a side effect of the reading, I was looking at words all the time. So I learned how to spell. And I had to take those words and put them into sentences. So I learned grammar and syntax. I learned how to express myself. And you have to take those sentences, you have to make them into images. So you learn to use your imagination. All of those things are extremely important. Hello, my name is Layla, and my mummy has epilepsy. Maybe your mummy, daddy, or someone else in your family has epilepsy. I hope this book will let you know what to do if they have a seizure. My mummy wears a special necklace to tell... Half a world away from Baltimore, in the city of Bristol, UK, lives a remarkable young lady called Layla. I hope An avid reader with a limitless sense of wonder for the world around her. Layla turned her passion for knowledge into a profession when at the age of seven she became a published author. There wasn't a book about adults with epilepsy for children and, and I thought it would be nice if it was written by a child as well. Because if you didn't have this book you would think, oh, what shall I do? I've done really well today. Layla's mum, Sarah, developed epilepsy following a head injury when she was a child. Alongside being mum to Layla and her baby sister, Sarah also works as a carer for adults with learning difficulties. Even with her medication, Sarah still has unpredictable seizures. And it was trying to find something to explain why they happen that led to Layla's amazing achievement. I looked everywhere for a book about epilepsy, aimed at a child who's got a family member with epilepsy, but there was just nothing out there. I noticed Layla was carrying around a notepad, and I was curious what she was writing in there, and uh, had a little look, and she'd written loads of information about epilepsy. I thought, this is a really good idea. So I looked into having it published. Local publisher Pomegranate Books thought so too, and put Layla's book to print. So far, it's sold over 300 copies around the world and has set Layla on course for her future career. I want to be a writer. Um, I'd like to write adventure books, story books, information books. I am very proud of her. It's lovely that seeing how vivid imagination she's got. It just takes me back to when I was a child. 
she's uh, eager to be a teacher and she's also wanting to write more books for example but she was asking my father-in-law uh, about his diabetes recently so I know she wants to write a book to help children who's got a family member with diabetes. I just think it's amazing that she just wants to help so many people. It makes me feel really proud. We can learn a lot from children. Their sense of wonder and thirst for knowledge puts the world at their feet. It was this discovery and a strong faith that set a young Ben Carson on the path to an extraordinary life. I would get on the bus and I would go downtown to the Detroit Institute of Arts and roam through those galleries until I knew every painter who painted each picture and when they were born and when they died and what period it represented. And I was always listening to my portable radio, uh, listening to classical music. And you know, I'd be walking down the streets of Detroit listening to classical music and people thought I was nuts. This guy's crazy. But years later, when I decided that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, well, I wanted to go to the place that's best known for neurosurgery, and that would be Johns Hopkins. But as I said before, they only took two people a year out of 125 applicants. But when I got an interview and I went there, the fellow who was in charge of the neurosurgery residency program, George B. Uvrahai, was also in charge of cultural affairs at the hospital. And uh, somehow, the conversation turned to classical music. And we talked for over an hour about different composers and their styles, conductors, orchestras, orchestral halls. There was no way he wasn't taking me in the program because he had to have somebody to discuss these things with. But what I emphasize to young people all the time is there's no such thing as useless knowledge because you never know what doors it's going to open for you. And uh, the more you know, the more options you have. We cannot trace you know, the origins of a thought. We cannot define where imagination comes from. And I'm not sure we ever will, because that exists in a different dimension. The brain is the conduit through which we reach that other dimension, but we have no way of quantifying and measuring it. But we do have the ability to enjoy it and to use it to the fullest extent. We've reached the end of the four chambers and seen four amazing stories about how compassion, courage, vision and wonder can light the way to real happiness. I believe we should aspire to live these virtues every day, to show compassion and kindness, to never stop learning, to live with purpose and to do the right thing. We'll feel happier, closer to our loved ones, and more connected to the wider world. At the beginning of the Four Chambers, I asked you to imagine what it would be like if every interaction you had left the other person in a better place than when you found them. Well, imagine what it would be like if thousands of us started doing just that, striving to make our relationships better, putting other people first, and living to make the world a better place. Join me on a new journey to make this decade the most creative, peaceful and loving yet. We all have the key to unlock our potential inside our own four chambers. <laughs>